Good evening, everybody. This is uh, an update, or if you like, a reboot of a series of videos I did uh, some years back. Um, they are sort of two longish, I suppose, videos that I've done back to back. And, and I had to cut them down somewhat to, to fit them in uh, the various time slots that uh, I could afford. Um, but I don't have that problem now. So I'm going to show them both to you <coughs> unabridged, as it were, as they came out of the machine. Okay, these two films from 1959 or thereabouts show the principles and operation of the navigation and bombing system, NBS, Mark 1. This is an analog navigation bombing computing system uh, outfitted to the V bombers, uh, Vulcan, Victor, and Valiant. This worked in conjunction with the H2S Mark 9 ground mapping radar that uh, was also fitted. The Mark II version, um, an earlier version, is actually fitted to just Jane, just up the road there at the Heritage Centre. Bit of history where I come into this. I first came across this system in 1970 when I joined 617 Squadron at Scampton as a little red Omec of 17. Uh, but it wasn't until 74, after I'd done several training course, further training courses, that I really started to get to grips with, this, with the equipment. Uh, I got to know it, uh, love it, and hate it in uh, various measures. Uh, being analog, um, it was, uh, as, it says, as it says, it's all mechanical, um, extremely convoluted, a bit high Heath Robinson in places, as you'll see when you when you see the films. Um, and uh, this is where I got my love of analog systems from, because it is quite amazing when you see it all together working as it should to produce the navigation and bombing solutions. Um, I actually taught this system in the mid 80s at RF Marham at the ground school there that I put together. Um, and it wasn't until I finally left there in 88. Um, and I said goodbye to it then and I went off to uh, RF Scampton again, where I uh, worked in the system test facility uh, for the AI-24 Fox Hunter Radar development flight. Um, yeah, so as you watch these films, yeah, enjoy it. Um, yeah, kick back, have a brew. Yeah, uh, look back as um, how it used to be in, in the good old days. Okay, so anyway, uh, part one is the navigation computing and part two is the bombing computing. Um, so yeah, hope you all enjoy. Sit back, have a brew, put your feet up and enjoy it. And we'll catch you with the next video. Take care now, stay safe. At near sonic speed, navigation and bombing calculations have to be made almost instantaneously and with meticulous accuracy. This is accomplished by the Navigation and Bombing System Mark I, provided that the air crew and servicing teams work together with the utmost efficiency. This bench layout shows the complex nature of the equipment. NBS will be fitted in the Valiant, Vulcan and Victor. The responsibility for servicing it and maintaining it at peak efficiency falls on the Royal Air Force fitter. He is given a thorough training in all aspects of the installation. This film is to be used as one of the many teaching aids in this training program and deals with the principles of computing in NBS. The calculation of the position of an aircraft at any instant depends on a knowledge of its ground speed and track. These cannot be measured directly, but are found by combining the known values of air speed and compass heading with wind speed and direction. This is one of the basic calculations performed by the NBS. The compass heading, height above sea level and air speed together with the radar display are the only basic pieces of information fed to the computer circuits. 
Compass heading is relayed from the gyro compass as a shaft rotation by an M motor transmission system. Height is delivered as a voltage from a servo mechanism which monitors the movement of a barometric capsule and which also drives this counter. Air speed is also given as a voltage. The beta head pressure is balanced by a fan in the air mileage unit. The shaft speed of the fan is proportional to true air speed. A switching device operated by the shaft feeds charges to a reservoir condenser at a rate proportional to shaft speed. This device is known as a bucket machine. It is used at other points in the computer where a voltage proportional to shaft speed is required. Any input data which has direction is resolved into its north-south and east-west components by a device called a resolver or sine-cosine potentiometer. Here is a working model of the resolver. This airspeed voltage, obtained through the bucket machine, is fed to these resistances in the sine-cosine potentiometer. This shaft is fed from the compass repeater. These output voltages give the north-south and east-west components of the airspeed voltage. Notice how the components are altered by a change in airspeed voltage. Or by a change in heading. The potentiometers are center tapped and are fed from a balanced voltage source so that the sign of the components can be either positive or negative. Thus, for all values of the heading angle, the north, south and east, west components of the airspeed will be calculated with the appropriate sign. If the north, south and east, west components of the wind are accurately known, they can be added to those of the airspeed to give the north, south and east, west components of the ground speed. The way in which the radar display is used to check the accuracy of the wind data will be described later. The compounder performs precisely the opposite function to the resolver. If it is fed with the right angle components, it will calculate the magnitude of the resultant as a voltage and the angle as a shaft rotation. Here is a working model. This servo mechanism moves these sine-cosine potentiometers until this error voltage falls to zero. This voltage gives the magnitude of the resultant, and this gives its angle. By feeding in the north-south and east-west components of the ground speed, when the error voltage falls to zero, we obtain the resultant ground speed and track. For example, if south and west components are fed in. When the error voltage is zero, we obtain this resultant in a southwesterly direction. The ground speed and track are transmitted to the navigator's panel for display on the speed meter and track dial. The integrators provide a means of summing up shaft movements to give aircraft position or distance travel. The voltages representing the right angle components of ground speed, which have been obtained by adding air speed to wind speed, are also fed to a pair of servo mechanisms. Feedback voltages are obtained through bucket machines, and the servos deliver shaft speeds proportional to the applied voltages, that is, to the ground speed components. The shaft movements are integrated or added up in two different ways. Firstly, by counters which are geared to clock up latitude and longitude on the navigation panel, and secondly, by potentiometers in control unit 585, which deliver slowly changing voltages proportional to ground miles covered north, south and east, west from a chosen starting point. In each case, M transmitters are used to relay the shaft movements to the M receivers at the remote points. Here is a still photograph of a PPI display. Information may be abstracted from the display with a high degree of accuracy by the use of electronic markers. These consist of a range ring and a bearing line. Their intersection forms a datum which may be placed on any selected radar response by this joystick.
Although the markers behave as polar coordinates, range and bearing, they are always derived from the north-south and east-west components which are available as voltages on the marker potentiometers. The radar picture and the bearing line are both referenced to true north. That is, north is made to be at the top of the display irrespective of the heading of the aircraft. Now let us suppose that the aircraft is momentarily fixed in space. When the operator moves the joystick, the coordinates X and Y of plan range to some arbitrary point P are set up on the marker potentiometers. To convert the rectangular XY coordinates to range and bearing, or polar coordinates, another compounder is used. As before, the angular position of the shaft of the sine-cosine potentiometer gives the bearing of the point P. The potentiometer shaft moves a pair of contacts. These are closed by a roller driven by the mag-slip shaft. When they close, the PPI trace is momentarily brightened and gives the bearing of the point P relative to north. The compounder also delivers the plan range of the point P as a voltage. The radar system, however, measures slant range and not plan range, so that the time scale of the PPI is proportional to slant range. Because of this, the plan range voltage from the compounder must first be converted to slant range voltage by solving this triangle before it can be used to control a range marker on the PPI. To solve the triangle, two linear potentiometers are set up at right angles. These represent plan range and height. This tape which links the sliders represents slant range. The sliders are driven by servo mechanisms and they continue to move until the voltage on each slider exactly balances the applied voltage. The distances along the potentiometers are then proportional to the applied plan range and height voltages. The tape is made to move the track of a third potentiometer through a distance equal to the hypotenuse of the triangle. This potentiometer, therefore, delivers a voltage proportional to slant range, and this is fed to the waveform generator where it controls the time delay of a range marker pulse which brightens the PPI trace at the appropriate range. The point P on the ground, defined by the rectangular coordinates set up on the marker potentiometers, is now marked on the tube by the intersection of the range circle and bearing line. The operator himself completes the servo loop. When he moves the markers onto a response T, the voltages set up on the marker potentiometers represent the planned distances north, south and east, west to the point T. Now let the aircraft move again. The response would immediately drift away from the markers in the reverse direction to the aircraft's track. In practice, however, the marker potentiometers are driven through differential gearing by M transmissions from the appropriate shafts of the north-south and east-west ground speed motors. The aircraft's ground displacement is therefore continuously subtracted from the marker potentiometer settings made via the joystick. On the tube, the marker intersection will move at the same rate as the ground movement so that the selected response will remain under the markers. Here is a speeded up record of an actual display in flight. The voltages on the marker potentiometers vary continuously representing the coordinates of plan range to the response. If there is an error in the wind set into the system, the ground speed drives will be incorrect. The markers will drift off the response at a rate proportional to the error. After a short time, the accumulated error may be removed by using the joystick to reset the markers onto the response. If, in doing so, this key is also depressed, the necessary movements of the marker potentiometers are also fed to the wind potentiometers. This corrects them in the right direction. And, if a specified time interval is allowed to elapse, the right amount of correction will also be applied.
If the aircraft is flying in this direction, the picture on the PPI display will move like this. By applying to the deflector coils of the PPI shift currents that exactly oppose this motion, the picture of the ground can be made to remain stationary while the center of the scan, shown here as a white dot, traces out the path of the aircraft. This is known as the stabilized PPI display. It is available on all positions of the function switch other than normal. The shift currents are obtained through two shift potentiometers driven by the same shafts as the marker potentiometers. The markers vary continuously so that their intersection remains near the center of the display. Movement of the joystick now moves the whole picture so that any selected radar response may be placed under the marker intersection which remains near the center of the display. The pivot point traces out the path of the aircraft. Here is a speeded up record of an actual stabilized display. Note that the ground pattern is stationary, that the pivot of the scan shows the position of the aircraft, and that the markers remain on a selected point near the center of the display. When the function switch is set to homing, the X and Y voltages stored on the marker potentiometers are used to give steering information to the pilot. The voltages X and Y, which are proportional to these distances to the selected point T, are fed to a pair of sine-cosine potentiometers. These are driven by the track shaft of the ground speed and track compounder and so resolve the X and Y distances along and across track. The output voltages are thus proportional to this distance, the track component of range, and to this distance, the cross track component of range. This divided by this gives the tangent of this angle, which for small deviations is equal to the angle off track. This information is fed to the pilot's left-right indicator or to the autopilot. If the aircraft is now turned until the needle is central, the track angle will be equal to the bearing of the response. The aircraft will therefore track over the point T. The voltages from the marker potentiometers feed two independent computer chains. One operates the markers, and the other feeds the pilot's steering circuit. By feeding extra information into the marker circuit, it is possible to place the selected reference point A under the markers, while the pilot's indicator guides the aircraft to an entirely different point B. This second point need not be visible as a radar response. It is only necessary to know the distances north-south and east-west of the reference point A from the homing point B. These distances, the offset coordinates, are inserted manually into the marker circuit. The accuracy of the latitude and longitude counters is maintained by feeding in the exact position of the aircraft from time to time to remove accumulated errors. A certain amount of time must be spent in pinpointing the aircraft's position. Information on the aircraft's movement during this time interval is stored by the marker potentiometers. At the instant of switching to fix, when the aircraft is at point A, the numerators are disconnected from the ground speed drives. The ground speed drives are connected instead to the marker potentiometers, so the marker intersection will remain on the point A. The subsequent movement of the marker potentiometers represents at any time the distances north, south and east, west traveled by the aircraft from point A. On switching back to normal, the marker potentiometers are driven back by the setting motors which also drive the numerators by the same amount. Thus, the movement of the aircraft while the switch has been on fix is fed into the numerators. To check the aircraft's position on a G-fix, 
The function switch is turned to fix as the aircraft passes through a known G position A. The numerators are checked against the node latitude and longitude of the point A and are corrected manually if necessary. Switching back to normal resets the numerators to read the corrected position of the aircraft at that instant. Any clearly defined radar response P, whose latitude and longitude are accurately known, may be used to obtain a fix. When the function switch is on fix, it is arranged that the numerators are connected to the setting motors controlled by the joystick. Having selected fix at point A, the joystick is used to move the selected point P under the marker intersection. As the numerators are connected to the setting motors by M transmissions, they will follow the movement of the markers and will move by the coordinate distances of P from A. Since the numerators were disconnected from the ground speed drives at point A, they should now read the latitude and longitude of P. If not, it means that they were incorrect when fix was selected at A. The necessary corrections are applied by resetting the numerators manually to the known latitude and longitude of the point P. On switching back to normal, the setting motors drive the marker potentiometers to zero. At the same time, the numerators are reset by an amount equal to the vector sum of the coordinate distances of A from P and the distance travelled since selecting fix. When the marker potentiometers reach zero, the warning light ceases to flash, the numerators are reconnected to the ground speed drives and normal DR computing is restored. The numerators now read the corrected position of the aircraft. The effect of wind on an aircraft is to make its actual track differ from its heading by a drift angle delta. After a time interval, the vectors representing air mileage and wind mileage may be added to give the aircraft's position. Now, suppose that a bomb is dropped when the aircraft is at this point L. The bomb's initial airspeed, which is the same as that of the aircraft, will be continuously reduced by the air resistance. When the aircraft has covered this air mileage, the bomb will only have covered this distance. The wind, however, has the same effect on both the aircraft and the bomb. So, adding the same wind mileage vector as before, we get this position for the bomb when the aircraft is here. As the wind mileage vectors are equal and parallel, this line is parallel to this one, the heading of the aircraft. And this angle is equal to the drift angle delta. Thus, as the bomb falls, it trails back along the heading from the aircraft. By plotting its position at equal time intervals, we obtain the path of the bomb over the ground. When the bomb strikes the ground here at P, the aircraft is at point M, which is known as the whole range point. This distance, MP, is called the trail. It is resolved along and across track to give the track and cross components of trail. This distance is called the forward throw. It is equal to the distance from the release point L to the whole range point M less the track component of trail. The vector distance from the release point L to the point of impact P can thus be specified in terms of forward throw, a long track, and cross trail, a cross track. You will remember that when the operator brings a response under the markers, its coordinates, X and Y, are set up on the marker potentiometers. These coordinates are converted by the steering circuits to track range and cross range. The problem of dropping a bomb onto the target is solved in three stages. First, the forward throw and cross trail of the bomb are calculated. 
Secondly, cross range is compared with cross trail and the aircraft is steered on such a track that they are equal. And thirdly, track range is compared with forward throw so that when the two are equal, the bombs are released. To find the forward throw, it is first necessary to calculate the whole range distance LM, which is the distance the aircraft travels while the bomb is falling. This is equal to the aircraft's ground speed, VG, multiplied by the time of bomb fall. The time of fall is determined by the vertical motion of the bomb and is the sum of three components. An ideal term, which is the time of fall from rest in a vacuum, a climb and dive term, and a time lag term, tor. Multiplying each term by VG gives the expression to be solved by the NBS computer. The first term is proportional to the square root of height. A potentiometer fed with ground speed voltage VG is turned by a square rooting pinwheel which is driven by the height servo shaft. The second term is proportional to the rate of change of height and is obtained from a capacity commutator or bucket machine fed by VG and driven by the height servo shaft. Division by the gravity term G is achieved by suitable scaling. The sum of these two terms gives the time of bomb fall in a vacuum multiplied by VG. In practice, the air resistance reduces the downward velocity of the bomb and its time of fall is increased by an amount tor or time lag. Thus, the whole range distance is increased by VG tor. Tor is a complex function which varies with the type of bomb and with height and airspeed. The distance VG tor is synthesized in NBS by applying a suitably scaled ground speed voltage to a network of resistors. Trail results from the effect of air resistance on the horizontal motion of the bomb and this also varies with airspeed, height and the type of bomb. Trail voltage is generated by applying a suitably scaled airspeed voltage to a network of resistors. The trail voltage, thus calculated, is multiplied by the cosine of the drift angle delta by a potentiometer which is driven by a differential mechanism fed from the heading and track shafts. This gives the track component of trail, which is subtracted from the whole range distance to give the forward throw. A second potentiometer driven by the drift angle shaft is used to multiply track trail by the tangent of the drift angle and so give the cross component of trail. The ballistic terms, time lag and trail, cannot be simply represented mathematically. They are built up in NBS by a complex network of resistors, sections of which may be switched in or out by a bank of switches. The setting of each of these switches is determined by one frame of a film on which is stored information on the ballistics of the bomb. Each type of bomb has its own film. Each frame of the film is divided into a pattern of 36 squares arranged in four columns along the film and nine rows across. Each column corresponds to one of a series of height zones. This one, for example, covers from 30,000 to 40,000 feet. All but one of the rows correspond to a series of airspeed zones. This covers 350 to 400 knots. Thus, on each frame, there is one particular square corresponding to the aircraft's airspeed and height. The ninth row contains some ballistic information which does not vary with height and airspeed. The information on the film is read off by a photoelectric cell in this film reading mechanism. This is the film cassette. Here is the optical path. The light from the exciter lamp is directed onto the appropriate row of squares by means of a shutter acting across the film. The column is selected by a mirror which scans along the film in synchronism with it. The position of the shutter is determined by that of a shaft in the airspeed servo system. The phasing of the film relative to the mirror, which is determined by the height servo shaft, causes the selection of the appropriate height column. 
For any set of flight conditions, the light through one particular space out of 36 on each frame is passed to the photo cell and whether the space is transparent or opaque determines whether a certain switch in the ballistic circuits is closed or open. Each frame of the film sets one switch. When the function switch is turned to bomb, the film runs through the reading mechanism automatically and in synchronism with it, a travelling carriage sets up a mechanical matrix in accordance with the required switch settings. The action shown here has been considerably slowed down. The information is then punched in to the switch contacts, thus synthesizing time lag and trail for the bomb to be released from the aircraft at the relevant height and airspeed. If either height or airspeed change to another zone, the film is scanned again to reset certain of the switches for the new flight conditions. We have now seen how forward throw and cross trail are calculated in NBS. If the markers have been set on a target, the aircraft must next be turned until cross range is equal to cross trail. It will then track down the correct path to the release point. This is done by feeding the algebraic difference between cross range and cross trail to the steering circuits so that when the pilot's meter is on zero, the two are equal. Track range, which is being calculated continuously by the steering circuits, is compared with a calculated forward throw. Their difference, which is the distance to go to the release point, is displayed to the pilot on the lower needle of his directional indicator. When it reduces to a predetermined figure, the bomb doors are opened, and when it becomes zero, the bombs are released automatically. The offset technique used for homing can also be used for blind bombing of a target which gives no radar response. The markers are set on an easily recognisable response and the offset controls are used to feed extra information to the marker circuit. It must be appreciated that as the aircraft is turned onto the correct track for a bombing run, heading, ground speed, drift and therefore trail and forward throw are all changing simultaneously. Air speed and height may also be changing. Without the automatic servo computer, it would be humanly impossible to make these calculations at the speed necessary. In practice, the crew have only to keep the markers on the target and the steering meter central. The equipment will do the rest.